Lefshistov Lef Isakovich Shistov, born Yegida Leib Schwarzman, was a Russian existentialist philosopher, known for his philosophy of despair. Born in Kiev on February 12, 1866, he emigrated to France in 1921, fleeing from the aftermath of the October Revolution. He lived in Paris until his death on November 19, 1938. Shistov was born Lef Isakovich Swartzman in Kiev into a Jewish family. He obtained an education at various places, due to fractious clashes with authority. He went on to study law and mathematics at the Moscow State University but after a clash with the inspector of students he was told to return to Kiev, where he completed his studies. Shostov's dissertation prevented him from becoming a doctor of law, as it was dismissed by University of Kiev on account of its revolutionary tendencies. In 1898 he entered a circle of prominent Russian intellectuals and artists which included Nikolai Berdyaev, Sergei Tyagulev, Dmitry Miraskovsky and Vesely Razanov. Shostov contributed articles to a journal the circle had established. During this time he completed his first major philosophical work, Good in the Teaching of Tolstoy and Nietzsche, Philosophy and Preaching, two authors profoundly impacting Shostov's thought. He developed his thinking in a second book on Fyodor Dostoevsky and Friedrich Nietzsche, which increased Shostov's reputation as an original and incisive thinker. In All Things Are Possible Shostov adopted the aphoristic style of Friedrich Nietzsche to investigate the difference between Russian and European literature. Although on the surface it is an exploration of numerous intellectual topics, at its base it is a sardonic work of existentialist philosophy which both criticizes and satirizes our fundamental attitudes towards life situations. D. H. Lawrence, who wrote the foreword to S. S. Katelyansky's literary translation of the work, summarized Shostov's philosophy with the words, everything is possible, this is his really central cry. It is not nihilism. It is only a shaking free of the human psyche from old bonds. The positive central idea is that the human psyche, or soul, really believes in itself, and in nothing else. Shostov deals with key issues such as religion, rationalism, and science in this highly approachable work, topics he would also examine in later writings such as in Jobs Balances. Shostov's own key quote from this work is probably the following, we need to think that only one assertion has or can have any objective reality, that nothing on earth is impossible. Every time someone wants to force us to admit that there are other, more limited, and limiting truths, we must resist with every means we can lay hands on. Shostov's works were not met with approval even by some of his closest Russian friends. Many saw in Shostov's work a renunciation of reason and metaphysics, and even an espousal of nihilism. Nevertheless, he would find admirers in such writers as D. H. Lawrence and his friend George Isbitaly. In 1908 Shostov moved to Freiburg, Germany, and he stayed there until 1910, when he moved to a small Swiss village named Kapit. During this time the author worked prolifically. One of the fruits of these labors was the publication of Great Vigils and Penultimate Words. He returned to Moscow in 1915, and in this year his son Sergei died in combat against the Germans. During the Moscow period, his work became more influenced by matters of religion and theology. The seizure of government by the Bolsheviks in 1917 made life difficult for Shistov, and the Marxists pressured him to write a defense of Marxist doctrine as an introduction to his new work, Potsdas Clavium, otherwise it would not be published. Shistov refused this, yet with the permission of the authorities he lectured at the University of Kiev on Greek philosophy. Shostov's dislike of the Soviet regime led him to undertake a long journey out of Russia, and he eventually ended up in France. The author was a popular figure in France, where his originality was quickly recognized. In Paris, he soon befriended, and much influenced, the young George Isbitaly. That this Russian was newly appreciated is attested by his having been asked to contribute to a prestigious French philosophy journal. In the interwar years, Shostov continued to develop into a thinker of great prominence. During this time he had become totally immersed in the study of such great theologians as Blaise Pascal and Plotinus, whilst at the same time lecturing at the Sorbonne in 1925. 
In 1926 he was introduced to Edmund Husserl, with whom he maintained a cordial relationship despite radical differences in their philosophical outlook. In 1929, during a return to Freiburg he met with Edmund Husserl, and was urged to study Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. The discovery of Kierkegaard prompted Schistoff to realize that his philosophy shared great similarities, such as his rejection of idealism, and his belief that man can gain ultimate knowledge through ungrounded subjective thought rather than objective reason and verifiability. However, Schistoff maintained that Kierkegaard did not pursue this line of thought far enough, and continued where he thought the Dane left off. The results of this tendency are seen in his work Kierkegaard and Existential Philosophy, Vox Clam Antis in Deserto, published in 1936, a fundamental work of Christian existentialism. Despite his weakening condition Schistoff continued to write at a quick pace, and finally completed his magnum opus, Athens and Jerusalem. This work examines the dichotomy between freedom and reason, and argues that reason be rejected in the discipline of philosophy. Furthermore, it adumbrates the means by which the scientific method has made philosophy and science irreconcilable, since science concerns itself with empirical observation, whereas philosophy must be concerned with freedom, God, and immortality, issues that cannot be solved by science. In 1938, Schistoff contracted a serious illness whilst at his vacation home. During this final period, he continued his studies, concentrating in particular on Indian philosophy as well as the works of his contemporary Edmund Husserl, who had died recently. Schistoff himself died at a clinic in Paris. Schistoff's philosophy is, at first sight, not a philosophy at all, it offers no systematic unity, no coherent set of propositions, no theoretical explanation of philosophical problems. Most of Schistoff's work is fragmentary. With regard to the form the style may be deemed more web-like than linear, and more explosive than argumentative. The author seems to contradict himself on every page, and even seeks out paradoxes. This is because he believes that life itself is, in the last analysis, deeply paradoxical, and not comprehensible through logical or rational inquiry. Schistoff maintains that no theory can solve the mysteries of life. Fundamentally, his philosophy is not problem-solving, but problem-generating, with a pronounced emphasis on life's enigmatic qualities. His point of departure is not a theory, or an idea, but an experience, the experience of despair, which Schistoff describes as the loss of certainties, the loss of freedom, the loss of the meaning of life. The root of this despair is what he frequently calls necessity, but also reason, idealism, or fate, a certain way of thinking that subordinates life to ideas, abstractions, generalizations, and thereby kills it, through an ignoring of the uniqueness and livingness of reality. Reason is the obedience to and the acceptance of certainties that tell us that certain things are eternal and unchangeable and other things are impossible and can never be attained. This accounts for Schistoff's philosophy being a form of irrationalism, though it is important to note that the thinker does not oppose reason, or science in general, but only rationalism and scientism, the tendency to consider reason as a sort of omniscient, omnipotent god that is good for its own sake. It may also be considered a form of personalism, people cannot be reduced to ideas, social structures, or mystical oneness. Schistoff rejects any mention of omnitudes, collective, all unity. As he explains in his masterpiece Athens and Jerusalem. But why attribute to God? the God whom neither time nor space limits, the same respect and love for order. Why forever speak of total unity? If God loves men, what need has he to subordinate men to his divine will and to deprive them of their own will, the most precious of the things he has bestowed upon them? There is no need at all. Consequently, the idea of total unity is an absolutely false idea, it is not forbidden for reason to speak of unity and even of unities but it must renounce total unity, and other things besides. And what a sigh of relief men will breathe when they suddenly discover that the living God, the true God, in no way resembles him whom reason has shown them until now. Through this attack on the self-evident, Shostov implies that we are all seemingly alone with our suffering, and can be helped neither by others, nor by philosophy. This explains his lack of a systematic philosophical framework. 
but despair is not the last word, it is only the penultimate word. The last word cannot be said in human language, can't be captured in theory. His philosophy begins with despair, his whole thinking is desperate, but Chistoff tries to point to something beyond despair, and beyond philosophy. This is what he calls faith, not a belief, not a certainty, but another way of thinking that arises in the midst of the deepest doubt and insecurity. It is the experience that everything is possible, that the opposite of necessity is not chance or accident, but possibility, that there does exist a God-given freedom without boundaries, without walls or borders. Shostov maintains that we should continue to struggle, to fight against fate and necessity, even when a successful outcome is not guaranteed. Exactly at the moment that all the oracles remain silent, we should give ourselves over to God, who alone can comfort the sick and suffering soul. In some of his most famous words he explains. Faith, only the faith that looks to the Creator and that He inspires, radiates from itself the supreme and decisive truths condemning what is and what is not. Reality is transfigured. The heavens glorify the Lord. The prophets and apostles cry in ecstasy, O death, where is thy sting? Hell, where is thy victory? And all announce, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Furthermore, although a Jewish philosopher, Shostov saw in the resurrection of Christ this victory over necessity. He described the incarnation and resurrection of Jesus as a transfiguring spectacle by which it is demonstrated that the purpose of life is not mystical surrender to the Absolute, but ascetical struggle. Curtius Homo? Why, to what purpose, did he become man, expose himself to injurious mistreatment, ignominious and painful death on the cross? Was it not in order to show man, through his example, that no decision is too hard, that it is worthwhile bearing anything in order not to remain in the womb of the one? That any torture whatever to the living being is better than the bliss of the rest satiate ideal being. Likewise, the final words of his last and greatest work, Athens and Jerusalem, are, Philosophy is not bison but struggle. And this struggle has no end and will have no end. The kingdom of God, as it is written, is attained through violence. Isaiah Berlin Shostov was highly admired and honored by Nikolai Berdyayev and Sergei Bulgakov in Russia, Jules de Gaultier, George Isbitaly, Lucien Levy Braul, Paul Selin and Albert Camus in France, and D. H. Lawrence, Isaiah Berlin and John Middleton Murray in England. Among Jewish thinkers, he influenced Hillel Zeitlin. Today, Shostov is little known in the English-speaking world. This is partly because his works have not been readily available. Partly the specific themes he discusses are unfashionable and foreign. A somber and yet ecstatic atmosphere permeates his writings. And his quasi-nihilistic position and religious outlook are an unsettling and incongruous combination, at first sight. He did however influence writers such as Albert Camus, Benjamin Fondaine, the poet Paul Selin, and notably Emile Siren, who writes about Shostov. Shostov also appears in the work of Jill Delos, he is referred to sporadically in Nietzsche and philosophy and also appears in Difference and Repetition. More recently, alongside Dostoevsky's philosophy, many have found solace in Chistov's battle against the rational self-consistent and self-evident, for example Bernard Martin of Case Western Reserve University, who translated his works now found online, and the scholar Liza Knapp, who wrote The Annihilation of Inertia, Dostoevsky and Metaphysics. This book was an evaluation of Dostoevsky's struggle against the self-evident wall, and refers to Shostov on several occasions. According to Michael Richardson's research on George Isbitaly, Shostov was an early influence on Bitaly and was responsible for exposing him to Nietzsche. He argues that Shostov's radical views on theology and an interest in extreme human behavior probably colored Bitaly's own thoughts. These are Shostov's most important works, in their English translations, and with their date of writing.